Kings and the 13th chapter tonight. Uh, and so you can go ahead and have that ready. Um, as we have been doing, we're going to reserve our announcements uh, for um, after our Bible study. Uh, and we'll, we have a number of updates we want to share with, uh, with folks here at that time. But right now, um, Les, if you would lead us in prayer to begin our study, that'd be great. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together and study your word. We pray, Lord, that uh, we will get a proper understanding and be able to apply it to our lives in the way you intended for it to be best for us. We thank you so much for all the mere material blessings that you bless us with and pray that you'll continue to give us those things that we need. We thank you, Father, for your Son and our blessed Savior and the sacrifice he made that we can have forgiveness for our sins and be able to be with you in eternity. We thank you so much for the brothers and sisters we have in Christ that we can <coughs> encourage and gain encouragement from. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to always conduct our lives in a way that will be the best example to not only them, but uh, everyone we come in contact with. And I pray that you'll be with Philip as he directs a class this evening, that he'll be able to say things in a way that'll be easy to understand and we can gain much from study of your word. I pray that you'll be with those of our congregation that we've been praying for that are having health problems. You'll bless them with each individual with the needs that each one needs. They'll have better quality of life. We pray, Father, that you'll forgive us for our sins and help us to always look to you for guidance that we can overcome any temptation that comes our way. We pray for your grace and for your mercy. In Christ's name, amen. All right, as I mentioned already, we're in 2 Kings, and we're going to um, start the class off with just, again, a, a brief reminder of the structure of the last four chapters. We talked about this a little bit um, last week, and so this little illustration of kind of what goes on in those two chapters is both review, but it also helps us understand a little bit of an interesting shift in the narrative or the teaching or the historical record of the text here. Um, you may note that more so in 2 Kings than in the earlier historical books we've read, there is not a strong adherence to a linear timeline where things have to like follow one person to the end. Uh, like it's just their whole life and that's all that it, it, comes, it starts, middles, ends. There's a couple of reasons that are super obvious as to why that happens. And then there's the God doesn't say side of the, of the coin as well. So one of the reasons that's super obvious is that Israel is breaking apart. Um, and so with greater Israel separating into two kingdoms that are synchronous in time, but asynchronous, that means they're not lined up in the way the Bible records all their events, and they're not exhaustive, where we get every single detail of every single major event, that means that some of the things that we're going to read are kind of going back and forth, and sometimes there are segments where that person's spiritual activity that was really important to moving the Bible story forward is highlighted early, and then they pop back out later in the storyline, and we get like, and by the way, or... In this case, there's a couple of chapters, this one and the next one, where it's like, okay, there's, there's these other things going on that are important. So that's part of it. So there's that historical side. But also there's the theological or God teaching us about God and spiritual things that takes place in stuff like this, which is there's these um, images that we need to kind of pay attention to that are repetitive in the text because they're going to point to something. And that thread that weaves itself from Genesis to Revelation uh, is the one that we keep looking for and seeing. And we've talked about it a lot. Um, our typical answer to that is it's Jesus, right? Um, pause for a moment when you give that answer and think through in the Old Testament because 
Jesus as a person is not named in the sense of this is what their name is. And by the way, Jesus in Greek is Yeshua or Joshua in Hebrew. And so um, it's not about the name It's because you know, there's lots of Joshua's in the Old Testament. Um, what are his titles, though? Because that's a different thing. There's a name, like his personal human designator, uh, which is kind of important. Um, um, Yeshua or Joshua is kind of important in that sense. But what are some of the titles that appear in the Old Testament about this unrevealed, mysterious moment? Because it's not revealed until we get to the New Testament. What are some of the things you remember? Or a section of the text that you think might have it? The Word. The Word made manifest. How about Messiah or Anointed One is a phrase that kind of comes in. Um, there are some imagery that comes as titles. He is a lamb that comes from Revelation and Isaiah. Uh, suffering servant. Is that another section of the Bible text that we kind of re recognize talking about Jesus there when Isaiah talks about the suffering servant? And one more, shepherd, right? Um, he identifies himself as being the good shepherd, right? And what's a, what's a psalm that we all know that kind of talks a little bit about shepherd life, kind of? And you hear it in songs. It's read almost at every funeral. We sing it. Psalm 23. Psalm, psalm 23 of the 23rd Psalm, which has those themes but attached to the title that is ascribed to the wonderful event in the arrival of Jesus, Greek, Yeshua, Hebrew, or Joshua in transliterated Hebrew, which is the Son of God. Um, and so that's helping us pay attention to something like these small stories that are repeats because they're supposed to make us think about what, what are we supposed to look for? What are we looking for? What's missing? What's missing in my life? What's missing in Israel's life? What's God promised that we haven't seen yet? And so think about the promises made to Adam, Abraham, and broadly. There's a seed promise that goes through all of them. The land promise. So they're seeing land. They're seeing great people. But the last title we can think about is Jesus being the seed. Um, and that's also something that gets picked up a lot in the New Testament as well. Um, Les, did you have something there? I was just thinking that I think uh, Lord is another term that he's uh, referred to. Isn't that what David say? The Lord said to my Lord. Uh... Yeah, there's, there's a whole interaction there that comes. And so um, Adonai or Lord is definitely eventually ascribed uniquely to Jesus, although its normal use in the Old Testament is God the Father, uh, which we read generally kind of recognize those things. Um, and um, I say Adonai, there's another couple of different ways you can pronounce that um, intentionally obscured Hebrew word. Uh, it's, it's, no one really knows how to pronounce that particular Hebrew word, and so almost everyone kind of just picks a thing, and say that's what it is. And Adonai is the one that is pretty common for that. So that's all kind of the backdrop to this thing. So we talk about Second Kings. It's not about history per se. It's not even about the nations per se, although that's the storytelling method that God is using. That's the learning model he's using. Look at these people. Look at how they live. What did they do? Where did they follow me? Where did they fail? But then look for God in the middle of all of that which has us coming to 2 Kings 13, verse 1, where it reads, In the 23rd year of King Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel in Samaria. And he reigned 17 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Israel. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. 
He did not depart from them. So thinking about what we noticed here in the four chapters prior of how these two almost David behaviors, like they're almost a good king like David, because that's the model of good king in the Old Testament. Um, but then we get back to this new chunk, and two things jump out right away. One, how long does he reign? 17 years, and it attaches it to a secondary time stamp in the second verse there. And remember, for an Israelite king, this is not like a numerological thing where like the number is super big significance, but 40 years was like the good amount for Israel. If you reigned for 40 years or you did something for 40, that meant it was you did a good thing. It was significant. It was important. It was necessary. And is 40 a number you read a lot in the Old Testament and the New Testament? You don't see a lot of people doing it, but it reappears, right? 40 days, 40 nights. How many years did they wander? Right, so it, it shows up in significant things. So anytime it's not 40 in these year marks, that's like it's not significant or insignificant. And so basically we're clued in right away, this king's not important. He's not like David. He's not like Solomon. Not important. Secondly, the thing that we identified in Bible class last week as one of the primary failures of these two reigns, Jehu Joash, is the first thing that's highlighted in this list. Look, he's not just like maybe kind of making a way forward to good. He's regressing, regressing all the way back and making the people to sin. That's an important question to think about when we start kind of understanding what that means. How does a king cause a nation to sin? Because I thought we had free will. So my thought there was, was in regard to the high places. Because it's not the sin of your own setting up a separate system of worship. Yep. So part of that is they, they kind of clung to that. And every time a new king would come into place, they just left it there. Right. Um, Jeroboam the first, if you will, kind of using that way to, to kind of attach him out. It's about the golden calves for him. Um, which, when you're reading through the Bible, the golden calves immediately are a big thing, right? You're thinking about Israel. Um, you're thinking about Moses. Uh, and what's the classic way that we can describe Aaron's response when Moses comes down the mountain and he, there's these golden calves, and what's Aaron's basic response? Just I don't know, man. They just out, out. People did things. Cow, that's like this. It wasn't me. Is that human behavior when we're caught red-handed? Sure. Like, denial. It's denial before there's acceptance. And denial is sin in of itself, but it's sin heaped on top of sin. Like you're, you're layering a bad cake that you're going to eat one way or the other. And so that takes place there, but, it, but then it never really left. There's a lot of time between the golden calves of Aaron, which is incorporated in part from Egypt and other nations, and the golden calves of 2 Kings 13. So you think about not just Jeroboam bringing it back in, reestablishing, setting him up. This is an ongoing issue. And I've said this before, there is a myth that when Israel returns from captivity, they're done with idolatry. That's the myth. The myth exists because we don't have strong written record of prophets and God's people fussing about it. But when you see Jesus deal with them, is there idolatry in the first century? Yeah. Well, yeah. They've turned God's setting into idolatry for them. Oh, no, I can't do that. We've made a vow by the temple. And we made a vow, oh, we can't do that. That's idolatry of a different shape. All they've done is shifted into a new nasty pool from the old nasty pool. 
Um, and so Rich is right. This is a continuation of this long-standing issue. Um, then there is going to be a way to think about this is the clawing at the remains of the carcass of Israel. If we consider as a fair possibility that David Solomon is the strongest, fattest Israel, is that fair? David's Israel was strong. Solomon's Israel was fat. As it goes into captivity and as the vultures, which is one of the way the prophets describe them, start picking at the carcass of Israel, that's what you see taking place here. Their power, which once exceeded the weak nations around them to the point that Egypt said, yeah, no, we're not even going to mess with you. Now they're being closed in on and you see those Scavengers, smaller nations, bigger nations. Syria becomes one of the foils. Uh, they're constantly pulling at them, and it starts to show up. And so in verses 3 through 9, we see that kind of playing out. And Michael, would you read that for us, uh, 13, 3 through 9? So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. He gave them continually into the hand of Isaiah, the king of Aram, and into the, sun, into the hand of of ben Hanadad, the son of Hazael. Then Jehoaz entreated the favor of the Lord, and the Lord listened to him. He saw the oppression of Israel, how the king of Aram oppressed them. The Lord gave Israel a deliverer, so that they escaped from under the hand of the Armenians. And the sons of Israel lived in their tents as formerly. Nevertheless, they did not turn away from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, with, it, with which he made Israel sin, but walked in them. And Asherah also remained standing in Samaria. For he left Jehoaz of the army not more than 50 horsemen and 10 chariots and 10,000 footmen. For the king of Aram had destroyed them and made them like the dust at threshing. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoaz and all that he did in his might are they not written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Jehoaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria, and Joash, his son, became king in his place. So this is like not what we'd expect, right? Because at least two things happen I thought were like off of the expected path of kings right now. What might those two things be, or what else did you see that was surprising right here? Because we've already set the stage that this king isn't that great. In fact, he's making Israel sin, and he's engaging or allowing idol worship and the pagan practices of the other nations to creep in. So based on our classes we've had so far, what's, what, what does he do that's different all of a sudden? He saw the favor of the Lord. Yeah, it's like super surprising, because how consistent are kings doing that right now? Like, it's like not, not the thing. Furthermore, think back. How far back do you have to go in your mind to remember a king who seemed to consistently do that? Not just a one-off, but like consistently, the text says, they, they tended to do that. Ahab. Now, Ahab does it. Does it go well for him? Yeah, because well, well, how do we describe Ahab? What's some of the terms we've used? Wishy-washy. Wishy spineless. By the way, he's spineless as compared to his final adversary who slays him and his household, who is a hard man. Joab, Ahab, those, uh, those two guys, polar opposites, right? Um, one has all the spine. The other one doesn't have any at all. Uh, but successful followers, you've got to almost go back to David and kind of Solomon to get consistency that way. So right here he does that, and the Lord responds in a different way. What has been some of the ways that God has answered questions like this so far? Ahab questioned the Lord, a prophet was sent, and a spiritual entity of some kind was involved, and what they do? 
You guys remember some of those stories where they were tricked and ensnared? This one is not that, right? It's a pretty small snippet. So what's the, what's the response? God sends a Savior, but do we get a big description? How many of you wanted a big, big description? Or at least some details? Like, I'm sorry, like, I would like some backstory or like who's going on there. So I can give you some suggestions to think about. Um, verses 4 and 5, where this takes place, is very similar to Deuteronomy 26, verses 5 through 9, which is part of the promised structure of God's plan for Israel. There it reads this way. And you shall make response before the Lord your God. A wandering Armenian was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there. Uh, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us, and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror and signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So on the very least, what you see here is a connection to God's blessing, independent of the king. Um, and so the method isn't necessarily laid out. A number of folks suggest a possibility of, we've just got one more person involved that could be the savior, the servant savior space. Anybody not, yet, not dead yet that's kind of important? Who, who, whose death is recorded in the next chapter over? Chapter 14. Elisha, right? Do you think Elisha, as we read of him, is somebody who might have the power to fix a thing if God granted it to him? Yeah, Elisha, Elijah, they're the, the, the twin dynamos of the Old Testament prophets that like everyone's kind of measured up against those guys. Ooh, you've got a portion of a spirit. You've got a double portion. So certainly that's a possibility in thinking it through, but not necessarily something we can say the text says. Because it doesn't. It just says a savior over oppression. And it's synonymous or similar um, to what takes place back in Deuteronomy as a kind of a, a, a model, if you will. But nevertheless, the text already said what his overarching life was like for this king. Golden calves, can't let them go. Quick question about that. On a personal level... Or on a thinking about this king's level, why do we hold on to our golden calves? Because that metaphor certainly can apply to us, right? Do we struggle to let things go that are harmful to us? So why do we do that? Why do we keep hanging on to it? Some of it, like in his case, the text kind of lays out just like his family line. Like, this is what we do, and this is how we do it. What else can you think about that might help us understand this a little bit more? Sometimes it brings temporary pleasure, and we're short-sighted. Yeah. Um, the, the familiarity of family context, or this is how it's always been, or the, the nostalgia reminiscence, or that it actually produces a short-term outcome we appreciate. Because what did this do for his, the roles of the kings? It allowed them to ease the people. Oh, don't worry about that. I know it's, we can't go down to Israel and to Jerusalem right now. We can't, we can't do that right now. But you can just worship right here. It's okay. Here's a, here's a false god. We've, you know what? There's historical precedent for Israel worshiping this false god. Now, do they say false god when they make the appeal to it? Now, we've got a history of Israel worshiping God through this idol. And so the golden calves, we hold on to them because we've either become so comfortable with them, we can't imagine life without them. We tend to think that it's okay. Or like Michael pointed out, we, we enrapture ourselves with the joy of it. We feel like, well, we got to have it. We kind of like it. 
Um, and that's only in the spiritual context. I'm not even dealing with just general other good things that we sent him to hold on to. Like just in this context right there. But he is buried in a royal tomb. And his son, another Joash, um, Jehoash, um, is going to be put into place as the king. So that's just typical. Like this, names get repeated a lot. Um, and so if you're trying to sort out who's who, um, you're playing Where's Waldo on a, on a scale of history as opposed to um, just a page. Next part of the text picks up here in verses 10 through 13. Um, and Les, could you read that for us? In the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, the son of Jehoash, began to reign over Israel in Samaria. And in he All right, so another insignificant length of king. And is he any different? Yeah, as far as we can read to this point, no king of the northern kingdom has been identified as being good. It doesn't mean they didn't do good things. It doesn't mean that at times they didn't lean into trying to do the right thing. But they are like their fathers. And as we pointed out, they are calf worshippers, cow worshippers. They worship the golden calves or the worship surrounding it. Um, his son is the fourth generation of Jehu. Um, this is going to be Jeroboam II. Uh, is going to take over and he will also be buried in Samaria. Um, that brings us to verses 14 through the end of the chapter. Which is the return of whom? Return of Elisha, as opposed to Elijah. And we've already kind of foreshadowed a little bit of that with chapter 14 and bits and pieces about it. Um, but we think about prophets for a moment right now. When you hear prophet, what do you think prophets do? We, we think of them as messengers, in part, because we tie together the English prophets with the English prophecy, and we say a prophet should be speaking or writing or, or telling. When you read from the prophets, are, all, are they scribes and like staying in a box somewhere and just constantly just writing in books? How many times do prophets get out with a sword and stab people? Are they kind of stabby? That's a technical term. They're pretty stabby when it's the false prophets, right? How many prophets assist in the slaying of hundreds of people? Many of them. Um, we don't need to exclude prophets in the way we sometimes exclude the Levites from counting them as warriors. Were men able to strap the sword and go out to fight? The prophets we find are actually doing all the things. Some of them seem to have swords. And in the context of the Old Testament, carrying around a sword, a sword, not a knife, your sword has a purpose, right? Swords are killing tools, killing of animals or people. That's just what they are. Um, they're not machetes designed to take down wild growth. They're designed to kill living beings in all the ways you might do it. Elijah and Elisha are equipped with a little bit more than a sword, though, in the Old Testament texts. What do they also have? A connection to an otherworldly or spiritual level of power that's far different than a priest or even a king. And the reason I say it's far different 
It's because God seems to have granted them the capacity to determine when to use it. God does his own thing too. But it, you see the prophet sometimes saying, hey, look at how much is on my side. Not exclusively, but at times they demonstrate, like, here's God's power being displayed visibly to you. Um, so when we get to Elisha here at the closing part of this chapter, remember we're looking at someone who's more than just a message bearer, though we do need that prophets do that. Sometimes the message of the prophet doesn't come written on a page or in a speech. Sometimes it does come at the tip of a sword. And so Elijah and Elisha are often in that role of doing more than just, I'm going to tell you what God said, you need to follow it. Um, verse 14 begins, though, or we see Elisha in a little bit different way now. Now, when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, Draw the bow. And he drew it. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands, and he said, Open the window eastward. He opened it, and Elisha said, Shoot, and he shot. And the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria, for you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them, and he said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground with them. And he struck three times and stopped. Then the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it. But now you will strike down Syria only three times. So Elisha died, and they buried him. Now the bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen, and a man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. Now, I added that one in person particularly because of what I said to lead up to it. His deathbed scene, you get, we just read it, right? Think of David's deathbed scene. Frail David, where there, everyone around him is scheming for power. Elisha's deathbed scene is way different, right? There's no scheming. He's a little cranky. You should have gone six times. Does the text say any kind of instruction at how many times you're supposed to go? But he didn't say stop. He just said pound these on the ground. And so we can make all kinds of thought processes of, hey, what's going on there? But the final end of it is he's still demonstrating his power because what's going on is he is revealing to him an outcome that hasn't come to pass yet. And so this is how it's going to be. Anyone want to go find Elisha's bones somewhere? <laughs> like, this is what, I'm going to go ahead and insert. When that happened, how many people started throwing bodies into that grave? Hey, is that going to happen again? Probably I'll run it. <laughs> yeah. Like, did we just find the fountain of a, re a resurrection well? So what's, here's a side point. When this happens, and the Bible records it, aside from its that's really amazing. It's a little out of place from what happens before and afterwards, right? So what's going on there? Why is this fair to say fun Bible story attached on to a mixture of sorrow? Elisha, the powered prophet of, of Jehovah, of God, is dying. The future of Israel is in his hands to a certain degree as he shares this message. And then, what is this supposed to show us? Because every time I read that story, I have the same reaction, like, wow. There's a lot of, of stuff going on. Bobby? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you can think about it this way. Would it be fair to think about Israel asking this question? If Elisha is dead, what's our future look like? Because have we seen any school of prophets running around with a new Elisha being trained? Has that been showing up for us in the text at all? Bobby? There's a foreshadowing element for sure. This is shadowing the future of Jesus. But here's a simplified form. God's prophet is dead, but God's hope remains. And Bobby kind of touched on it a little bit. It's his power is still there. We tend to, as people, adhere ourselves to the idea that I've got to have my champion with me still. And if my champion falls, then I'm done. That's a Bible story moment because what did the Philistines think would happen with their mighty champion, Goliath? Yeah, Goliath's got this in the bag, right? Taunting Israel over and over again. Young David with a sling, a couple stones, and a whole box of faith says, that's not how this is going to be. But Israel rallied behind his leadership, his initiative and courage. And so that's a human thing. And this is in some way um, kind of showing this out. And it happens at a weird time. In the reign of David, do you see Moabites coming in and kind of stealing from Israel? Or in the reign of Solomon? Is that like something that this text talks about? Like people from, like as a normal thing? Because, um, kind of set the scene here again. They're burying a friend, and a raiding party comes through, and they got to skedaddle. There's another uh, way to you know, get out, because we're not going to be able to survive this. Picture for a moment being the friend. You died. You pop your head out of the grave. Your bros are running that way. Moabites are coming over this way. Why am I here? What's going on? Like, There's a whole lot of mystery there um, that certainly um, is kind of underneath that text. And then I'll, I'll make this one little quick insertion here. Remember, the Bible is written to be read aloud. It's not, they, the first readers of it didn't read the scriptures in the sense of they all got their scrolls out and just quietly read together. Picture a grandpa telling his grandson the story by the banks of a river. That's the methodology of teaching. So they would gather them together and someone would read the scroll because um, scrolls were rare. And they would read to the youngest and the oldest, all in the same audience. Ever want to find a Bible story that resonates with younger audiences? This is one of them. Because the surprise, twisty ending is always a great way to get... Because we're enthused about it, right? We're excited by that surprise, twisty ending. Um, text will continue with um, some promises that go, go down. But before we close out and kind of look at that, um, let's go ahead and do this since we got a good five minutes. Wrong way. That's way. This is our what'd you like? What didn't you like? Uh, aside from the mysteries you've already kind of paid in, into, what do you guys see in the text right here in the scriptures for us? What seems important to you? I'm going to go ahead and give you one of my likes. I like... The last part of the story of Elijah, um, that whole grave moment foreshadows Jesus really well. It's surprising. It's a little out of place in some ways, but in the bigger picture of things, it gives these people hope. So what else? What's in your like or don't like category? I liked in verse 4 when he entreated the favor of the Lord, it says the Lord blessed yeah, and do you think this is a, like, we try to model our lives over the, after the best people we could find in the scriptures? 
Is this the best king you could find? Now, he's not the worst, but he's a contender. Like, he's in the running for low-order successes, and God listens to him. Remember why he would listen, because it wasn't about him. He was entreating the Lord not for his own success, but for the favor of Israel. What else? And kind of roll across the spaces of the... It struck me it's not... Uh, I mean, it's a little different from what you're talking about. It struck me kind of odd that this part of Elisha came up after uh, Joash was already told about being married, but then it's like it's out of chronological order as we read things. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing that's... you. I don't have a good answer to that. I don't think there is an answer to that. Um, my answers I gave are, you know, we, this is what we read. There's something going on in chapters 10 or 9 through 12. And it doesn't, ex it's not written like we want these things to be written. We want them to be written like we would do a history book or we would do a family's chronological order. If they're not following our rules, they don't have to. Um, and that's fine. But it also makes us wonder and think more and kind of consider, and I think there's probably some benefit to that. Um, I think God granted us intellect, reasoning, and curiosity, and having those are great Bible tools. It helps us understand the scriptures themselves better. Rich? And just a quick point of clarification, maybe you can help me out. So is the, the king who's talking to Elijah, is that the same king in verse 6? Or he's asking where his, his army is decimated. And is that why he's going to Elisha to say, hey, you know, what can you do for me? That seems like to be his ask because he's concerned about. So he's just saying Syria, Syria uh, oppressed them and made their army pretty much decimated. All right, so... Um, what we've got here is an interfolding layer of two things, two kingdoms as well. Okay. And so we're laying these out. And as I pointed out before, a lot of shared names. Like people get repeat names. Um, um, and the Elijah death is not necessarily attached to a time stamp. Okay. Um, and so it's really hard for us to latch it to a particular um, king because um, this is Joash, the king of Israel, um, um, and this other one in chapter 13 is Joash, um, um, a son of Amaziah, king of Judah. And so they're, they're two different thread lines uh, sharing the same name, which creates more chaos. Um, Syria oppresses both of them. Um, they're two small walnuts underneath the big vice of the, nut, of the nutcracker there um, that's squishing or clamping down on... Um, Greater Israel as a package. Those both things. Um, and so they're both just getting crushed. They're going to they're get ruined. Um, unless something happens. And so God's Savior, separate, independent of what takes place here. And this is a second thing uh, later. Okay. So, yeah, thank you. no problem. Hey, and it's confusing. Um, you ever seen those conspiracy movies where they like lay out 6,000 pieces of paper and they have strings going through it? That's the office space that I sometimes have to draw out, like to figure out who connects to who and who connects to there. you got to like really space it out. And I think when we close Second Kings, by the way, we're going to lay out a map uh, of all the kings and try to kind of think about them as a group and kind of have that as a closing class to First and Second Kings before the Chronicles, because Chronicles is even worse. Like it's just all over the place. It's less linear than the others uh, because it's, Less of a history and more of a, um, I wouldn't say propaganda because that's the right context, but a, let me tell you about these kings. Let me tell you about these people. Um, although there's little sections of it that are certainly propaganda. Um, that's it for class tonight. Um, and so um, we're going to continue in chapter 14. Uh, next Wednesday night, Stuart West will be teaching that class, so you can prepare yourself to get excited for Stuart and to help him out. Uh, I know he'll do a great job, um, and uh, I will be out of town uh, next Wednesday night. So thanks, everybody.